get the similar so Peter will be able to answer some of the questions. And uh, please note that we're going to be recording the session. And it, that's also should show on the top left hand corner of your screen a pulsing red light. So in terms of uh, an introduction uh, to Peter, uh, Peter Smith, of course, is our speaker tonight. And Peter has a degree in nuclear engineering uh, from the University of London and spent the first nine years uh, of his career working in the United Kingdom nuclear uh, industry. And in 1982, uh, he moved to Canada with his family, living first in Northwestern Ontario before moving to Sarnia uh, in 1987. After over 40 years uh, working in the energy industry, uh, Peter retired in 2013. And um, he now spends the bulk of his time pursuing his passions, the environment, human rights, and the promotion of science. In addition to being a frequent speaker on the environmental issues, Peter is a former director of the Sierra Club Canada Foundation. He's, he's an associate of the Bowman Center, a uh, member of Climate Action Sarnia Lampton, a longtime leader of the local Amnesty International Group. He's the media contact for the Lampton County Science Fair and a keen member of Science Discovery Squad. And Peter's married and has two children and three granddaughters. So I'll turn it over to Peter and uh, hopefully his presentation should come up on your screen. Thank you, Paul. I'm just gonna go and share screen here. And... <clears throat> There we go. Okay, so we're going to be talking about nuclear waste in Canada. And to understand where we are today, we really have to go back about a century or so. Um, and in fact, the, the closing years of the 18th century, and they discovered a thing called radium. Um, it's a strange metal. It's luminescent, which means that it gives off light all the time. It's not like something that's fluorescent that you, you put under a light, you know, and then it glows for a while afterwards. Luminescence really means that it's, uh, it's radioactive and it is giving off photons all the time. So that's where the light comes from. They didn't realize just how damaging this would be to human health. Um, they thought this was a great novelty. Obviously, it was really good for things, um, a watch or a clock that you wanted to be able to see in the dark. Um, but they started using it for just about anything. And if you can imagine it, um, some people actually put it into food and into things like toothpaste because they felt this was good. You could actually go and get a radium treatment, um, which was, was thought to be beneficial in some way. So what happened was um, in the early 1930s, they discovered what's called pitch blend um, in the Great Bear Lake North area of the Northwest Territories. And this pitch blend is an ore that contains uranium and radium and, and a number of other things. Um, and this really interested them because they were, they were after the, the uh, radium. So they opened the El Dorado mine uh, to produce radium because they wanted this glow in the dark element. Um, you may have heard stories about what happened to the, the young women that they used to have that would paint the radium onto the dial of watches and clocks. And apparently they used to lick the end of their paintbrush in order to, to get it to a nice fine point. Well, what they did was ingested small amounts of radium. And radium gives off a lot of alpha and beta particles. It's very dangerous, particularly when it gets into soft tissue. So the mouth and tongue. And these women died as, in some extremely nasty ways with um, different types of, of cancer of the mouth, tongue, and throat. But that wasn't known at the time. The other thing that happened was in the run up to World War II, um, uranium was wanted for the Manhattan Project, for, the, for the, the bomb ultimately. Now, most of that material actually came from the Belgian Congo um, because that was some high purity ore. And actually it was, was smuggled into America before America got into the war um, by a Belgian company that, that recognized that this was gonna be needed. 
part of what they were doing then was also trying to make certain that the Germans didn't get hold of this. We wanted this for, for the Allies. But with that, um, with the production of the bomb, there was a, a, an increased requirement for uranium. The military wanted to, to use it to build more bombs, of course, for the military. After the Second World War, um, we moved into a, an era where we started to develop nuclear power for civilian purposes. Um, we found more uranium in the Northwest Territories, parts of Ontario and Saskatchewan. And mining started in those areas and, and you know, nuclear power was starting to be used around the world. In fact, Canada was at one point in time the world's largest exporter of uranium. Um, in 2009, we slipped into second place after Kazakhstan, but we still supply about 20% of the world demand. Uh, however, the only working mines that we've got now are those that are in North Saskatchewan, although those are rather big uh, open cast mines, most of them. So take a look at the country, you can see all these are the nuclear facilities and you can see here, we've, we've got Port Radium up um, in the Northwest Territories there. We've got a number of mines here in Saskatchewan. Uh, coming down south, Blind River. Uh, there's the Bruce, here's the nuclear power plants. We've got the Bruce, Darlington, Pickerel, uh, Pickerel, Pickering. Um, Port Hope and Bancroft. Um, you know, Bancroft was a, one of the areas where we found some uranium. And then we've got Gentilly in Quebec and Point La Pro in New Brunswick operating nuclear power plants. If we look at all of our, this is often a surprise to people just how much of our electricity we have generated from uh, nuclear power. And, and keep in mind that about 60% of Ontario's power comes from nuclear sources, and about 20% of the overall Canadian. Uh, power comes, electricity comes from nuclear. So it's, it's, it's a big part of our economy and our electricity generation. And these just show out some of the, uh, the plants you can see there. Um, if we look down here, here are the Pickering plants, right? The, the A plants and the B plants. You can see the A stations have all been shut down uh, quite some time now, but the B stations are still operating. Here's the Bruce. Right, eight different reactors at the Bruce, uh, Point La Pro here, and then we've got the four at Darlington, which were the last to be built. And you can see that there's a lot of generation that has taken place um, from, from these plants. But it doesn't stop there because that's not an end to it. If we look at what's happening with these plants, Bruce A and B plants, we're spending about $13 billion to life, uh, give a life extension. The six of the eight reactors will run probably until 2064. And just think of that, that's, that's another, what's well, it, 43 years from now. So that um, upgrading and life extension work, that's ongoing right at the moment. The Pickering stations, uh, they're not in such good shape and the decision's been made to not do any more life extension work on them is not considered to be uh, uh, worthwhile. They're gonna run probably until about 2024, we'll depend a bit on whether we get the Bruce ones and the uh, Darlington reactors back in time. The other question about this, which we'll come back to later on, is, is when we should demolish those stations and what we should do with that area. Darlington, uh, in a similar sort of condition to Bruce, 12.8 million is the estimated cost to do a life extension to the four units there and then run those till 2055. Point Le Pro uh, is still operational. Then this had some money spent on it about five years ago. Wasn't looking too good for a while, but um, in the probably in the last two years, uh, operations there have improved a lot and a lot more reliable. And so now they're projecting that we'll run that out until 2040. So we've got this history of having generated a whole lot of energy from nuclear sources, we've been mining radium and, and uranium. We've run power plants for, uh, 
for a long time, we're going to run them into the future as well. All of that time creating what we call waste material. Now, one thing to before we get talking about the the um, sorry about that. Um, before we get to looking at the waste itself, is um, just to cover a little bit on fuel enrichment. And the reactors can do reactors um, run on natural uranium. And natural uranium is about 0.7% U235, which is the, the stuff you want for fuel. And the rest of it is U238. So can, the can reactors use this natural mix of uranium dioxide. Um, other countries have built different types of reactor systems that in the UK. There they have to enrich the fuel 2.5 to 3.5 percent in order to, to operate those plants. The boiling water reactors and pressurized water reactors, which are common to the, in the United States and most other countries around the world, um, they require an enrichment of between 3 and 5 percent. So what you're doing is basically concentrating the amount of that U235 in there. And this is it, it's a, it's very difficult to do because the two isotopes are chemically identical. The only difference that you have between them is the weight of, the, uh, of each nucleus. So you're trying to separate the two based on um, a very small difference between them. Now, what, a couple of other things to think about. Research and military reactors can sometimes use up to about a 20% enrichment. And I'm thinking specifically of things like a, a nuclear submarine where you've got a reactor that's got to do something that's got to be extremely reliable. It's got to be small, right? And so those are the kind of things where you go for a kind of reactor that takes a, a, a higher concentration in the, in the uh, in higher enrichment in the fuel. And then finally, you know, one of the concerns is always around uh, nuclear waste, whether somebody can make a bomb from this. Well, to make a, a fission bomb, you need to get more than a 95% uh, concentration in here. So you're not going to do that from, uh, from nuclear reactor fuels. That's going to be a, you know, that's a, 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 a difficult process to do. It would have to be something specific. But what it does mean is that if you've got some fuel from a nuclear reactor, it's not going to become a bomb. Nobody can turn it into a bomb or it's not going to become a bomb itself. So waste management strategy. This is something the government has obviously looked at several times and um, sort of poured over. Um, for economic reasons, Canada decided not to reprocess spent nuclear fuel, but to, to directly dispose of it. And what that means is that some countries, um, the US for instance, and Great Britain and a number of others, when the fuel is, is basically spent, when it's been, it's been in, it's been um, some of the U235 has been used up. They then basically dissolve that, pull it all apart, take out some of the, uh, the isotopes that you know, are not wanted or, or, um, or wanted for medical reasons, and then reprocess it to produce more fuel. We decided not to do that because it's, it's not as simple, I you know, hope it didn't sound simple, but it's not as simple as it sounds. You're dealing with a lot of nasty stuff you're separating it out, you then get into issues as to, you know, um, what happens to some of that material. We decided we'd keep it just as the fuel and then deal with the, the fuel specifically itself. In 1978, the Government of Canada launched the Nuclear Fuel Waste Management Program, which basically laid out some legislation and some processes and, and procedures. That was followed in 1983. They set up an underground laboratory. And you know, the, the goal is, or the aim, I guess, has always been at the end of this, that we would find some nice piece of very geologically stable ground. We would cut a mine shaft down and then um, a bunch of shafts coming off that. And we would put all of this nuclear waste at the bottom of this, this uh, well. Well, basically what they did here at, at White Shell in Manitoba was they created something like this and a smaller version of it because what they wanted to look at was things like air flows and the ingress of water and really testing it from a number of different ways. 
Um, they closed it in 2010, um, saying that at that point in time they'd done all the research they needed to do with it. So that part of it was, was a success. In uh, 96, we had another Radioactive Waste Management Act passed. And then in 2002, uh, the Nuclear Waste Management Organization was founded by the industry to develop a permanent waste strategy. And so you can see we've, we've been looking at this over a number of years, a lot of talking about it, a lot of writing about it, not much progress in actually doing some of this stuff. So what is the waste? Well, it, it basically comes in, in three or really perhaps four different categories. What's termed low and intermediate radioactive waste. Um, and there's lots of this stuff. There's, if you see here, low, 2.36 million cubic meters. Intermediate, we've got 33,000 cubic meters. And we just think of million cubic meters, that's an awful lot of material. And most of that comes from it, it, the early mining of uh, radium and uh, uranium. And it really is reflected, I think, in, in the fact that in those days, you didn't have in place the kind of procedures that you need to ensure that you don't leave a toxic legacy behind when you do some mining. Those were still the days when the idea was you can, yeah, we can mess up this area because there's another valley along there or another river, you know, and, and the care wasn't taken of that. So much of this stuff is contaminated soil. It's also things like uh, PPE, which is the personal protective equipment. So the PVC suits that you wear when you go into certain areas of the reactor. Uh, filters, um, all the time the building is under a negative pressure. So if there's a leak anywhere, air will leak into it, which means that you're pumping air out and you put that through a filter. So those filters are um, extremely, you know, they're, they're very fine and can pick up anything. All of that material gets, gets checked um, and all of those filters end up in, in the low and intermediate radioactive waste. Cleaning materials, brushes, dust, buying, um, you know, brooms, all of those kind of things. And then also iron exchange resins. And these are the things that are used to, um, to take dissolved minerals out of the water that's used inside the reactors. So this is all, you know, the, the things that you see listed there, that's all materials that are generated as the plants are running. And of course, they're going to keep on running so we can expect more of this type of material to get produced over the years. This lower level material doesn't require shielding. It's usually packed into uh, oil drums and you know the lids are put on them. This, this is the kind of, of stuff, it's, it's a low, um, so, you know, low danger. Nothing much is gonna happen to it, but it's, it's put away in, um, in barrels. And right at the moment, this stuff is stored in above ground warehouses, right? Because there's nowhere else to put it at the moment. And I'll come back to those buildings a little bit later. High level nuclear waste in Canada is just down to waste fuel. It's used fuel. And if you look here, this is a, an illustration of a fuel bundle. And that thing would be about um, a meter and a half long, say. Each one of those tubes is um, zirconium alloy casing on the, on the outside and inside there are pellets of uranium dioxide fuel. And these are probably uh, about a centimeter in diameter and the, the pellets are probably maybe three, four, five centimeters long. The fuel comes in, in those bundles. So, that, you know, imagine this one's been into the reactor, it's come out, it's now radioactive, it's giving off a lot of heat. Initially, we stored these in, uh, in water, for just for cooling. Um, these are below grade pits. They're probably 20 to 30 meters deep. Um, the fuel is, is stored then on racks down below in those things. 
They kept them for several years. Really, the, the issue is that you, if you left them out in the air, they would overheat. They'd eventually split through the, the zirconium casing um, and release um, radioactive material into the air. So you need to make certain that they stay underwater. It's probably between 10 and 15 years that they're there. Um, as you can see, 58% of all of the material that we have used so far is still in underwater. Only 42% of that has now been, uh, been brought out. And that's about 50,000 tons of material, which is, is uh, sorry, 50, yes, 50,000 tons. No, that should be. That's, uh, that, that number looked wrong for me, but I'll have to check on that. 11,000 cubic meters anyway, which is, is still pretty, uh, pretty large. Now, you may have heard of the China syndrome. You may remember there was a movie made of this. Um, I think it was around about 1980. And um, it's a good illustration of why you should not learn science from Hollywood movies, because it, it dealt with a nuclear reactor and there was a fear that um, uh, procedures weren't being followed and that it was going to be dangerous. And this was, it was obviously set in the US. And the fear was that um, the thing would, um, wouldn't trip when it was supposed to, wouldn't shut off when it was supposed to, what we call a scram event, which basically means an emergency shutdown. There was concern that the rods wouldn't go in, it wouldn't shut down in time, the fuel would melt, the fuel would then drip down and pool in one area. Um, and remember, this is talking about a, a a US type reactor with a higher concentration of U235 and higher more enrichment. And that this would come become like a self-sustaining reaction at that point in time. So it wouldn't blow up, it can't turn into a bomb, but it can get very, very hot, give up a lot of heat, and it would actually sort of potentially melt whatever's below it and go down. The China syndrome came from this idea that it would potentially just keep going and going and going and go through the earth and come out the other side, which is decidedly silly because if you think about it, by the time you got to the center of the earth, there is no gravity working to pull it through. Zero gravity at the center of the earth because of the, the earth all around it. But it doesn't do that anyway. In US reactors, um, they're designed so that if that meltdown did happen, the, the material would actually collecting a number of different uh, locations around there. So you'd never get that, that sort of super critical mass. But also with the, uh, with the Canadian system using the natural uh, mix, the, the uh, unenriched fuel, you don't even, you can't get to that point where if you just pull more and more material, it will never go critical by itself because it's, it's, uh, only 0.7% uh, concentration. So the, sign, uh, the, sorry, the China syndrome is not a, an issue at all for, uh, for Canadian reactors and Canadian fuel. So there's also been some other activities that are not related to power generation going on. And these are the things that, at places like uh, Chalk River. And they don't tell you too much about what's going on there. Um, basically, they do a lot of research, produce medical isotopes and, you know, a few other things. Um, however, material is moved between Chalk River and the U.S. facility at Savannah River. And at Savannah River, they do a lot more of that um, reprocessing the fuel and materials. So some of the material that travels between the two um, is, is uh, more active in 2016 they made a request to, uh, to move 150 truckloads of material. Now this is the stuff that had originally come from the US and it was bomb grade uranium um, together with some other highly radioactive fission products. It was basically stuff from old weapons that uh, we wanted to get some of the um, isotopes out of it. And uh, thus this, this whole lot had been uh, dissolved in nitric acid. So this was, was um, a real problem. And at that point in time, there was a lot of organizations. I was with the uh, Sierra Club at the time. Uh, a lot of organizations opposing that. 
um, just because of the p potential for this. We've never moved this kind of material as a liquid. Obviously, there's a you know, much greater chance that it will leak out and, and do something. So that material is still in storage at Chalk River, right? And it's important to remember that when we don't move stuff, like, you know, they requested here to send it down to Savannah River to, to further process it. We all said, no, don't move it because there's, there's a risk of doing this. It's now all of it is just waiting at Chalk River, right? It's nothing has happened to it. They haven't, uh, haven't been able to do anything else with it. So if we just look at the country again and look at this, the areas where there are waste materials stored, um, you can see there's, there's stuff out here, you know, as far out as Alberta, Saskatchewan, um, lots of materials you know, stored down here in southern Ontario, uh, New Brunswick and Gentilly, the same places that we've seen before. You can see this, there's a lot of, particularly um, the, inter, the low and intermediate level stuff that's that far out. So, low and intermediate waste produced by the three Ontario nuclear power plants, so that's the Bruce, Pickering and Darlington, uh, are managed by what is now called the Western Waste Management Facility, which is located at the Bruce. Their intent and their desire is to bring that material that exists at Pickering and Darlington to bring that all to the Bruce site. Right, and, and to hold it there. But that means moving it. That means moving it along roads. Um, OPG proposed to build a deep geological repository adjacent to, the, to this area at the Bruce to serve long-term storage. And this is for the low and intermediate waste. And this was what people were talking about this time last year. Um, there was opposition to it. Everybody said, no, this is stupid to put this next to uh, the Great Lakes um, and the project was cancelled. So that again means that this material is, is sitting, some of it is already at Bruce, some is at Darlington, some is at Pickering and it's, it's sitting in short term storage. And also widespread uh, opposition to Canadian nuclear laboratories and that's the, the guys at uh, Chalk River. Um, they had a plan for a 1 million cubic meter near service disposal facility at the Chalk River site. And that was really for the material that they've got there. And a lot of that is actually just old buildings, uh, which are very slightly contaminated just because of what went on in them. Um, but those old buildings need to be demolished and they need to put the stuff somewhere where it is safe. So then as far as the spent nuclear fuel goes, that again, that was being looked at more on a national basis. So the proposal there was to build a deep repository to store the spent nuclear fuel underground. At about $24 billion price tag to that, the vault would be 500 to 1,000 meters underground. Now, one thing to keep in mind when you look at that is, um, it, and, and this could be at Bruce, by the way. This, one of the sites they're looking at is that. Um, if you look at it, you know, if your concern is around the lake itself, the lake is only about 240 meters deep at the, at the deepest point. So they're looking here at a repository that is well below the level of the lake, right? It's not stuff that's then gonna come out of it and run into the lake and somehow get into the lake because it's, it's, it's way below there. Um, the spent fuel would be placed in, in baskets designed to last at least 100,000 years. And then they'd encase the, the tunnels. The idea was for the first, you know, as they say here, 240 years, they would be uh, keep it open so they can inspect it to make certain that the things they expect to see happen, happen, and the things they don't expect to see happen, don't happen, so they can kind of monitor it. Then it would be sealed and it would just be left there for um, eternity, essentially. Nobody's going to want to dig this stuff up afterwards. So the search uh, for a location has been ongoing since 2010. Uh, Ignace in northwestern Ontario and South Bruce are both being studied. I'm not certain when that report is due out, but I think we can assume that 
um, that as well may just simply get cancelled because there'd be public opposition to, to either of those locations. The other thing we've got to face coming up here is decommissioning because these things do get to a certain age and they need to be decommissioned. Typically, this is, is planned to take about 50 years and what they do is remove the fuel, um, demolish the sort of the, the administration building, the bits that don't have any nuclear uh, material in them and you know, would be otherwise clean, and then term, uh, do what's termed a safe store um, for most of that 50 years just to let the radiation levels drop down. So that really means it's a guarded facility, it's gated, it's, you know, there, there are security people there to stop anyone coming in or doing anything silly. Um, and the thing just sits there and slowly um, becomes less radioactive. But this does create a large volume of low and intermediate waste. So at some point in time, we're gonna have to deal with that. Um, the estimated cost for dealing with Pickering is actually $5 billion, which doesn't seem very much money to me. Um, we seem to spend billions of dollars very easily. So I, I was a little surprised to see that. An organization called Clean Hair Alliance, you, you may have seen some of their materials. They're arguing for immediate demolition. What they're saying is we should um, not wait for this to, uh, to sort of cool down from a, a, a contamination perspective, but just go in there and do it now. Basically rehabilitate that area and turn it back over to the public. Um, not certain what the, the consequences of that are, to be perfectly honest, in terms of, of uh, safety and, and how you do the work. It seems to be sensible to, to take a slower approach to this, but uh, you can only leave these things for so long as well. So public opinion has been, what, I think, one of the things that has been a constant source of, of problem for us. 37% you know, of Canadians are in favour of nuclear power, while 53% are opposed to it. Yet we have it. We've had it for years and we're going to have it for years more. Right? It's, it's a part of our life here. Uh, it's too late to say, don't make this stuff, it's already here, right? And, and they're going to carry on making it. Um, not surprisingly, um, you know, approval is highest amongst men and older Canadians. But there is a, an active and very well-informed anti-nuclear movement in Canada. Um, and, and that sort of came out when, you know, the 2016 thing with the, the 150 trucks. Um, a lot of people came out of them, a lot of knowledgeable people as well. There are over 300 public interest groups across Canada that have endorsed the mandate of the campaign for nuclear phase out. But we continue to use it and um, you know, particularly in Ontario, we will be for the next 40 odd years. The impact of this has been to oppose every attempt to move nuclear waste or to create a long term storage facility. And that's really the problem here. That's really, you know, why I wanted to talk about this was because we've all done it. We've all said, oh, no, you know, we don't want this next to, to the Great Lakes. Well, it's already there, except at the moment, instead of being in some kind of underground repository, it is in an above ground warehouse. Now, when I say warehouse, you know, you think of the, the sort of thin tin uh, buildings. These are much more substantial buildings there. They're designed to, to last probably a couple of hundred years. Nevertheless, when you've got something that needs to be controlled and locked away for 100,000 years, you know, something that lasts for 200 years is, is, is short term, right? It's almost temporary if you, if you think about it. Um, you know, one of the examples of this, you may remember in 2010, there was a plan to move 16 old boilers from the Bruce to Sweden for recycling. And those were to come down the, river, the, the lake and, and along the river uh, on a barge. And again, everybody reacted to that and um, it became impossible to do it in the end. And so they are sitting up there now um, on that, uh, the Bruce, right? The, those boilers are still there and they will stay there until somebody can move them. 
And, you know, it's easy to argue that, that that is probably much more of a risk than it would have been had we permitted this stuff to get put onto uh, a barge and carefully moved out of here and sent off to Sweden for recycling. So the conclusion on all of this is we do have to develop a safe storage repository at some point in time. We cannot leave this stuff above ground for all this time. This is, it, it's simply not fair to leave this to future generations to sort out. Then this nuclear waste already exists and we are scheduled to create even more. So it's not, we're not avoiding making something. We're already making it, it's already there. The damage is done. You know, it, it really isn't good enough to continue saying not in my backyard. We have got to find somewhere in this country and we've got a huge country and we've got some geologically stable areas, right? And, and if we do things properly, we can make this something that is safer than it is at the moment, which, which really needs to be the goal. Our failure to do anything to address this problem has really left us in the worst possible situation. We've got short-term storage. It's more vulnerable now than it would be if we did what we know we have to do at some point in time. So that brings me to the end of what I'm going to say. I think we've got about 15 minutes left. So, um, Paul, hopefully you've been not um, following the questions. So, yes, we have ahead. about uh, five questions here. So I'll okay. just start with the first one here. Uh, and I did want to mention that uh, uh, Climate Action Sarnia Lampton will be having some speaker. We're we have speakers scheduled till June, and then we'll expect to continue the series in the fall as well. But uh, this is from Stan. Uh, does U238 uh, become fissile in the reactor so it can become a fuel? Um, yeah, I mean, what, what happens in the reactor? The U238 does uh, capture some neutrons and um, it does turn into other elements. So it's um, one of the things that they do uh, in, in processing in other countries is remove things like the plutonium and you know, the other stuff that they can get out of it. So yes, it does change the nature of what's in there. Okay, uh, we've got a question here. Uh, uh, do the steam turbines become contaminated? No, they don't. Um, what we use is, is actually a double system. So you will see that the, the fuel is cooled by, by one liquid. That liquid then goes through a heat exchanger to the water that is going to be turned into steam and goes through the steam turbine. So um, that, that part of it, that steam system there, um, is independent of the, it, it doesn't come into contact, if you like, with the, the nuclear side of things. Okay, uh, we have a question. Can the zirconium be separated from the waste fuel? Uh, yes, it, it, it could be. Um, I mean, I think the reason that it, it's not, they don't plan to do it is that they want to, to keep the waste fuel inside those rods. Um, you don't want to give it an opportunity to get out of there and, and leak into the ground or, you know, um, become airborne in any way. So the, the plan is to keep it in place by, in the, uh, the zirconium uh, casing. Okay, we have another question. It says, does the water used for cooling need to be treated? Does the water have to be exchanged to keep up the cooling or is it cooled and reused? Um, so on a normal steam cycle, let's, let's say if you're, you've got a, um, let's say a coal fire plant or something like that, you use coal to, to burn, it creates uh, a lot of heat, that heat is transferred to water, right? turns the water into high pressure steam. The high pressure steam goes through the steam turbine and turns the wheels in the steam turbine and basically, you know, take energy as then going to the, the generator. As part of that system, you condense the steam at the very end um, to get the last bit of energy out of it, basically. And then that water goes back to recirculate. So the water gets used many times over. There's a slight loss for it, sort of 
one or two percent typically. Now um, that water can obviously um, become you know slightly contaminated um, so you can you can always run that water through um, the iron exchange units which we basically take out dissolved minerals and other materials um, in order to, to make certain that you're not sort of building up a um, contamination in any way so it, it's really it is re reused but you're also making up a small amount uh, all the time and you have the option of being able to, to process that water and clean it. Okay, uh, they want, is there really much danger uh, in transporting low level waste and spent fuel rods? Um, well, I think I would divide those in, in, into two. So this, this, the low level waste and, and the intermediate level waste, the same stuff, it, you just decide if it's low or it's intermediate based on the level of radioactivity that's coming out of it. Um, it those things, no, it's, it's, you know, really they, they're in barrels. Um, if somebody, you know, stole some, um, there isn't really very much they could do with it. They'd hurt, harm themselves more than anything. Um, it, it's, you know, you, and obviously you take precautions, these things are, um, don't go on the road by themselves. There's guards with them and things like that. So on the low level stuff, I would say you no. Know, there's very little risk associated with. It. Even if it gets into an accident, the vehicles that are used are more substantial and um, and capable of dealing with a collision. You know, the uh, the containment is stronger. With the fuel, um, yeah, that is a bit more of a of a concern. Um, because, you know, in the, the ultimate where perhaps it got into some kind of major road accident and there was a fire or something, um, that obviously is, is a greater risk. But again, if you look at the vessels that are used to transport those things, to, to transport the fuel, um, they are tested, you know, they have dropped from, I forget what height, onto um, onto like a wedge shaped thing to, to see if they will break open. They're made from very thick steel and lead so that the um, radiation doesn't get outside. Uh, they're, you know, it, it's a, when the, the trucks go off, they follow the security with them. Um, so the risk is, is a lot smaller. And, you know, and obviously there's more things you could probably do to that to make it even, uh, even more secure. You know, keep in mind at the moment when the fuel is processed, when the fuel is fresh, it is taken, it's transported on the roads and taken to those plants, right? So new fuel is going in, but the only thing that's not happening at the moment is the old fuel isn't coming out of there. So, I, you know, I think you can make a good argument that after keeping the things, the, the fuel rods underwater for the, you know, the 10, 15 years, whatever it takes for them to cool down, it would be pretty safe to be able to move them if you did it in a you know in a responsible manner and you know where you're going and um, you've got the equipment to deal with it at the other end. Um, you can make this as risk-free as possible. You know, one thing you've got to keep in mind is that this risk associated with absolutely everything we do, uh, and and really what we're looking for is what's the lowest risk way of dealing with something. Uh, question, are there any lessons to be learned from other countries? Unfortunately, really no, because nobody has done this yet. You know, there's, there's a lot of talking about this, um, but um, I, I'm not aware of any country in the world that has really can, can say that we have, uh, we've built the repository and, um, you know, we're, we're playing safe with the fuel. Um, they all seem to be suffering from the same kind of problems. Okay, uh, it says, what do you think of the smaller nuclear units starting to come on the market? Yeah, um, these have been talked about for a few years now, and um, they, they're referred to as, as um, by, by a number of names, but small um, and, and modular nuclear plants. And um, by the way, when they, when they say that, the category is, is not as small as you might think. Um, they're looking at anything less than 300 megawatts. 
Now, just think back to the Lampton Generating Station. That had four, 500 megawatt units in it, all right? So um, 300 megawatts is, is a lot of power. Um, that would be enough to sort of supply Sarnia probably three times over. Um, so some of these are, are, are quite large. The idea is that they're, they're modular, they're easy to operate, um, that they won't require sort of as much regular maintenance. Uh, you can understand this, you know, they're, they're attractive if you're thinking of how do we deal with um, communities in the far north, right? At the moment, most of those communities run, rely on, on diesel uh, to run their generation. And you really need something that is uh, more environmentally friendly in the future. But is it really a small nuclear reactor? Um, you know, I, I would have serious concerns about those things. Um, you, you know, who's going to operate them? What's the training that they're going to have? If you're, uh, you know, you've got a community, a northern community, well, if, if you really have in place all of the things you need in order to make certain that reactor is kept in, in good operating condition and that all of the maintenance is done properly and uh, procedures and stuff are, are followed. And that becomes more difficult, you know, the way when you move out to smaller areas, if you're dealing with something that's at the Bruce, well, there they've got all of the requirements in place, I guess, to deal with those kind of things. But it's, it's much more difficult for smaller communities. So, um, you know, really, in terms of powering remote communities and other areas, I'd rather see us try using renewable energy first a combination of you know, wind and solar and storage. Um, and perhaps we have to be a little more innovative there and perhaps you need some small amount of, uh, of diesel or something to back it up. But, you know, I think that is the future rather than these modular reactors. Um, they do really concern me as just to how safe they would be to operate. Are they going to be vulnerable to terrorism, for instance? Um, you know, ha, ha, just how do you deal with, with something like that? Um, I, I'd rather go with the simple systems that are easy to understand. And, you know, it's pretty easy to understand how a solar farm works or how a wind turbine works. Um, that's much easier to deal with than, than this. Uh, I know Jason Kenny has been really interested in using these because what he'd like to do at the, at the moment, the steam that is used to, um, to bring the material up out of the, the, the bitumen area. Um, that's produced using natural gas, which has a carbon footprint associated with it. He would like to be able to use nuclear plants, small nuclear plants to do that, so that then he can claim that they're more environmentally friendly because now they don't have the, the emissions associated with burning natural gas. Um, He's one of the last people I would want in charge of something like that, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> so I, I'm no fan of, of the modular reactors now. So, uh, we have a question that says, can low level waste be collected and stored at one decommission site as an immediate storage solution? Well, I think what um, that Western um, waste management uh, organization would like to do is to bring all the low and intermediate material from Darlington and, and Pickering and take all of that to the Bruce and store that in, in one location there. That's what, you know, even if it was an above ground uh, facility as, as there is at the moment, that's their preferred solution. They'd like to, to really get it safely underground somewhere, um, but that is, is sort of one step further along. But yes, certainly they, they would welcome, I think, the opportunity to move that stuff. Okay. Uh, are there any underground storage facilities anywhere in Canada? And what are other countries doing to solve this? I, I think, you know, a number of other com countries are, are looking at this. I know the U.S. Um, is, is planning a repository in the, uh, Oh, what's it called? Is it the Yucca Mountains of Nevada? 
Um, they've been talking about that for a while. I, I don't know just how far they've got along with that. You know, everybody's looking really at the same kind of thing that we need to do, is find somewhere that's geologically stable, where it's not going to get uh, damaged, you know, if you, if you put something there, um, put it down there and, and kind of leave it. It's, it's, it's sad, you know, in, in one way, because, you know, we really hate to, to do that, um, to put something in the ground and just say, well, we've got to leave that there, but what else do you do with it? We've already got this stuff. Mm. Uh, it says, how many years do we need to store the most radioactive waste and how can we warn future people or whatever life forms lives after us that there is a storage vault in danger? That's a good question. Will humanity last anywhere near 100,000 years? I mean, you know, that's basically what we're looking at is, for starters, to be honest, you know, in reality, you'd put that stuff in the ground and unless somebody in the future had found some way of turning it, you know, getting something valuable out of it. Um, I think you would just leave it there forever and ever. And you would not want to go back to it and, and nobody would want to get in there. Um, yeah, but, but how do you let somebody know? I mean, you know, it could be a, it depends what happens to humanity, I guess, whether we're still around um, or, or whether some other species is, uh, is messing up the world. And a couple of people were interested in knowing whether they've looked at storage in former uranium mines. Well, the the mines and the, the ones that are open in Saskatchewan now, um, and there, I believe there are five of them. I don't know much about them, but I believe three of them are, are just open pits. Um, and this was the, the material is all fair, you know, even in the others, it's fairly near the surface. We're really looking to store this material much deeper down than that. We want to make certain that it is below any kind of aquifer um, and, and sort of away from anything. Uh, the further down it is, basically, the more difficult it would be for anything to get out of there. So we want to go deeper than we would for, for those mines. Um, there may be some mines, I don't know, in the Sudbury area. Um, you know, there's some pretty deep mines there. I, I really not uh, not that well up on on the mines themselves, or, or you know, the old mines. That's the end of the questions. Uh, are there any other comments from anyone? Well, Peter, I, I think you did a great job and you certainly handled, there were quite a few questions and certainly handled all of those. Um, I believe we were just scheduled for one hour. So uh, uh, if some people do want to unmute and have a couple comments, that would be great. Uh, otherwise, our next uh, talk is going to be on uh, the virusphere. That's by Alan McEwen, and that's the 24th of February, which is again a Wednesday at 7 p.m. So uh, I can send this li the link when it comes out. I can send that to everyone that's on the list, and we will send out a reminder in case there's other people that are interested. Uh, but uh, I think that's uh, that was fantastic. You seem to know what you're talking about, Peter. Thanks, <laughs> I think. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for listening. <laughs>